Let's see a couple things. There's a new homework posted. This is a, I didn't get it posted until this morning. It's I chopped it in half, so we're doing half of the homework that I normally do this week and the other half next week. And it's actually fitting with the lecture anyway. So we're going to start today information about solving differential equations and Laplace transforms. And so that's going to be on part two homework next week. So the homework this week is fairly short. Problem number one takes a while. Number two, you're just solving two differential equations. Sorry, two algebraic equations and two unknowns. It's real quick. So make sure you find that. Um, in April, um, there will be an assignment due probably around April like 24th or 25th where you will enter the airplane we've been building into X-plane. So I have posted a couple videos on how you do that. It walks you through the process for a different airplane. And then I've also posted screenshots of the actual menus that you'll use for this airplane on Blackboard as well. So when you find time uh, sometime in the next two weeks, watch the videos about X-Plane. There's part one, and there's part two. And then when you get to doing homework 4.5, it's I know it's oddly numbered. It's because I squeezed it in one semester in there. So I just left it so that we don't get messed up with our sequence. Uh, there's also another video on flying the airplane. Because this homework will require you to fly the airplane that you entered into X-plane and collect some data. So uh, these videos are pretty detailed. I go through every menu that you have to do in order to enter the X-plane, enter the airplane into X-plane. And the screenshots that I've included there show all those menus with everything checked and everything filled out. So really, you're just copying what I'm showing you how to do in order to do the airplane. So I'm, I've already posted these just so that you can put, you know, schedule them in whenever you feel like you have time to watch them rather than you watch them a week before, although I guess a lot of people will wait till they have to do it. But gives you the option to watch them ahead of time if you want. There's also a fun video on how to do a catapult launch um, of an S3 sub hunter. Oh, this is a carrier. So if you want to do that for fun, and all this is done in X-Plane 9.73, and you find that on X-Plane dot com and look for legacy versions or older versions. If you, you go to this website, it's going to ask you if you want to download the demo for version 12, I think now. But if you scroll down, it'll say older versions, and then you can find version 9. And the reason I use version 9 is that it doesn't, you could run this on pretty much any laptop or computer, home computer that you have. You get up into 10, 11, and 12, it requires pretty, really good graphics cards to run the graphics and fly the airplane. And you'll be getting the demo version of this. And we'll talk more about that when I actually make the assignment for 4.5. But as you're watching the videos, have this thing downloaded because you're going to launch Plane Maker and just follow along the video and enter the data as you go to build your airplane.
All right, so we're <clears throat> done with a lot of the stability and trim and control of an airplane. And now we're going to do dynamics. And dynamics are described by differential equations, which you've had a class in. Um, so a lot of this stuff is review, although you probably haven't seen it for a year. When did you guys have DFEQ? Like a year ago? Yeah. Um, so we'll go through uh, the basics of this. But the idea is we're going to develop the equations of motion for an airplane uh, and learn how to solve those. So this, some of the intro material is not in your um, textbook, but there are handouts uh, on Blackboard, on Laplace transforms, which you've probably forgotten from differential equations that you should have covered, and we'll go back and review them and go over that again. Uh, make sure you pull up these handouts as we're going along here about how to do that. So today we're going to do straightforward differential equations, and then next time we'll start talking about Laplace transforms. So the, a nice system to illustrate this whole thing is with a mass spring damper system. So this is a mass, a chunk of something that's connected to a hard wall, an unmovable wall with a spring. Spring has a constant K. And then there's a shock absorber or a damper and it has damping coefficient. The spring resists displacement because if you pull the spring apart, it wants to pull it back and the damper resists velocity. It's a fluid filled cylinder so that if you pull on it and move it, it resists that movement. But if it sits still, there's nothing, no force applied. So we apply a force, can be a function of time, and then we track the displacement. And this is a nice, turns out it's a second order differential equation. It's an ordinary differential equation, which means it's just dx by dt and stuff like that. So it's a dynamics problem. So as you learned in dynamics, the first thing you do is for, draw a picture. That's called a free body diagram. And we've actually done a lot of these during the semester, right? Every time we draw the airplane and we put the forces and moments on it, that's a free body diagram. So for this system, we have the mass. We have the force this way in the positive x direction. And then the spring resists displacement, so it's k times x. If there's no displacement x, there's no spring because the spring's not stretched. And then the damper resist x dot, which is the velocity. And so Newton's law says some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. So that's what we do. We say F in the forward x direction, because we've already defined x positive to the right here minus k x minus b and we can we're going to write it like a regular differential equation right you guys have seen x dot a shorthand for dx by dt right all the time yeah in physics all right so that's equal to the mass times the acceleration 
And most of the time, the way differential equations are written, you put all the x's on one side and you put the input or the forcing function on the other side. And so that's really what's going on. This is a system. And this is the input, the external input. And then x is the response. All right, so let's jump over to the other board. I'll leave the video on that for a second while I erase. You guys caught up? We're good. So in rearranging, we get all of the X's on this side. And I'm going to divide by M because we just want the force. Um, we want, sorry, we want the, the highest order derivative to not have a co coefficient out in front. This is just kind of standard form. All right, so we got this all by itself. We got all the X's on the left and then the inputs on the right, the force. And in shorthand notation, of course, we could write it like this and we I'll tend to jump back and forth just assuming that we all know how this works. So often we'll write X dot and X double dot instead of the derivative. All right, so we have a system and it's dynamic, which means it's gonna move. So some simple problems that we can do with this is we can say, oh, let's, let me go back to the other picture over here. Some kinds of system response we might want to consider would be, all right, so there's a picture of the mass sitting still and the spring is unstretched. And we slowly pull the mass over here, say one meter over. So we have an initial condition of one meter. That's gonna stretch the spring, right? And so then at time t equals zero, we let go what's going to happen? Spring is stretched, right? Somebody say something? Oh. Yeah, well, that's the question is what's going to happen and, and how does it get there? Is this system stable? I've just, it was set in an equilibrium and I pulled it over to the right and then I let go. Yeah, okay, so statically stable. What's static stability says a force or a moment is generated to return the system back to equilibrium. So do we get that? Yeah, the spring stretches. And so there's that spring force. So that's all static stability is saying. Whenever we talk about that with regard to the airplane, It's always, there's a disturbance from equilibrium and something happens that's gonna return it back to equilibrium. Like CM alpha, alpha is the disturbance. The pitching moment is in the opposite direction to return it back to equilibrium. It doesn't say it goes there. So in this case, the spring force is generated <coughs> in the direction to return to equilibrium. So that looks good. It looks really stable. It depends on how strong the spring is, right? 
Now the dynamic side of this And it's called dynamic stability, but it's really, it's the dynamic response. So what's that gonna look like? Or do we know? I let the, the mass go, is it gonna move to the left? Sure looks like it, right? There's an unbalanced force. So it's gonna wanna move back to the left. Is it gonna come back and stop there? Eventually it probably will, right? But will it just slide over and stop or is it gonna overshoot and bounce back and forth? What does that depend on? What do you think? Exactly, the damper. If this damper has a lot of damping, it's gonna make it move real slowly because this is B times X dot. And so it will slide very slowly back over and then stop. <clears throat> And again, it depends on the spring, how strong it's pulling, and how much the damping resists the motion. And so that's the dynamics that we're going to want to find out from the airplane. Is that if we have a gust, airplane pitches up, CM alpha is negative, stability. It's going to return back, but how is it going to return back? Is it going to just come right back and start flying level again? Or is it going to go through the sky like this for a while? Obviously, if you're on an airplane and you're trying to drink your Coke, you're not going to want it to go like this through the air, right? Also, if you're a pilot trying to line up with a runway, you don't want your airplane going like this when a gust happens. So that's why the dynamic part of this is important. Okay, so let's go back over to our differential equation. <clears throat> So the, the first thing we're gonna look at is what in math is called the homogeneous solution. <coughs> and this is called the unforced solution in dynamics. And that's exactly what we were talking about there is that there is no force, but we have some initial conditions that are gonna cause it to dis be disturbed and see what happens. And there's math, essentially a math cookbook method cookbook procedure to solve this. And you've done that already in differential equations. Then the other part of this that we're gonna look at is the forced solution. Or in math, they called this the particular solution. Do you remember that term? And that's how we would analyze if the mass, say, is left here and then we apply, say, a 25 Newton force at time t equals zero. And the mass is gonna move over that way in response to the force, and then what happens? So we're gonna start with the homogeneous solution, do this first, and then we'll get into this. And again, most of this should be a review of differential equations and stuff you already done. All right, so here's the math process. The math backed up by a math theorem says that we can find every solution possible to this problem by assuming a homogeneous solution looks like this. S is a constant.
and you say, okay, my solution looks like that. And it turns out that if you combine a bunch of these together, add them together, enough of them, you get the solution. <clears throat> and by the way, this method works for linear differential equations, which means you don't have like x squared in there or sine of x or x dot times x or x double dot times x dot. Any products of the solution is not linear. So it works for equations where you have like a number times x and things like that. That's linear. All right, so here's my differential equation. I need to know what x double dot is. I need to know what x dot is. And I know what x is. x, we're going to assume, is e to the st. So what's x dot? And that's what's nice about this. It's easy to differentiate that exponential, right? So the derivative of e to the some number times t is just s e to the st. <clears throat> you learn that in calculus. And then another derivative is And so we stick that in the differential equation and we get and notice there's a zero here because this is the homogeneous solution. So for that, we set the forcing function to zero. <clears throat> and notice that we are trying to find an S to make it work, and you see all these e to the sts, and you go, gosh, solving an exponential is a pain in the rear, right? You have to take the ln, and this doesn't look good, except all of those can be factored out and canceled out. And we end up with a polynomial and we solve this for S. And so the S's that fit this work for this differential equation. You remember this from DFEQ? And you say, <clears throat> well, first off, who thought of this? And people worked on this a lot to figure this out. And how do we know this works? Well, in math, there's what's called an existence and uniqueness theorem that says that for linear differential equations, if you do this and you combine the two equations, the two solutions together that we're going to get, you get the you get the unique solution to the problem that fits the initial conditions and the solution exists so that we can actually find it. All right, so then all we have to do is solve this polynomial, and we can do that. There's two roots to this, right? It's a root because we set it equal to zero. If you just use the quadratic formula, The nice thing is when we divided by m, that meant a was 1. All right, so it's b minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And so that's how we find the values for s. And then the math theory says, okay, so we got two different s's that go into this that make it work, and so we just add the two different things together.
Right, and Zoom is saying there's no document attached for homework six part two. I'll check on that. You guys caught up with this? Anybody still writing? Good. All right, so the math theory says that we do this. That the homogeneous solution, because this was for f equals zero, is a constant times e to the s one. So that's our first root. And there's our second root. And that's all possible solutions. And we find these constants from the initial conditions. So that's the initial position and the initial velocity usually. So we'll put some numbers in here and go through an example so that we can see exactly how this all works. Um, the S1 and S2 have names in dynamics and math. Do you remember what you called those? Did they have a name? Usually they're called eigenvalues. And when you take 607 or any controls class, they're called the roots of the characteristic equation, or maybe, and sometimes in math they'll call them that as well, because that's the characteristic equation, that polynomial or they'll be called the poles of something called the transfer function that we'll get into in a bit. So in here, I tend to call them this stuff. I'll either call them the roots of the characteristic equation or the characteristic polynomial, or I'll call them the poles. And then the fourth solution, so that's the homogeneous, really is best illustrated by doing an example. Um, but if you have the fourth solution and the particular solution, so f of t is not zero, it's something else, um, you just find a particular solution that fits the differential equation. And that's real ambiguous. It's like, okay, just go find it. Well, what you usually do is you try an XP that's like the forcing function itself. Because you already got the, 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 the equation that works for zero there. So all you need to do is find an extra part that you add on that looks like this forcing function. And I'll show you how that works for our simple example. And so the whole solution is just going to be the sum of the particular solution and the homogeneous. Because the homogeneous solution makes this whole thing zero, and the particular solution gets added on to make it fit when there's non-zero on the right side. Let me erase this and get going on that. Can I switch boards? All right, so the total solution is just add all that stuff together. So X is the homogeneous 
plus the particular. Well, we're going to start out with that example where we have no forcing function. So we're going to find the homogeneous solution. We're going to say, let's pull the mass over and then let go. So that's the first thing we're going to do. How are we doing on time? 06? OK. All right, so here's our example. There is no forcing function. The mass is one kilogram. The spring constant is 25 newtons per meter. The damping coefficient is 12 newtons per meter per second because it damps out velocity. The initial conditions are, we're gonna pull the thing over to one meter and hold it there at zero velocity. So that's the thing where we pull it over, we hold it, then we let go. So the differential equation looks like this. This is B over M, so that's M is one. This is 12. This is 25, because that's K over M. And it's equal to zero. So that's with the numbers in. And then we're gonna assume that the particular solution, which in this case is the solution we're looking for, is equal to E to the ST. Differentiate that, so we're gonna get S squared, S 25. I think you can already see that every time you do this, you're gonna know exactly what to write down. If, after you've done five of these, you could probably jump from that to the polynomial with this canceled out, right? So this is our characteristic equation. When you set it equal to zero, this is the characteristic polynomial. So let's write it like this. Characteristic polynomial is this thing. This is the characteristic equation, which is set equal to zero. And so we'll use the quadratic formula to solve that for its roots. So here we go with the quadratic formula. So we've got minus B plus or minus B squared minus four, A is one, C is 25, all over two times A, which is one. So two into 12 gives me six. And then I can pull a two in there. Get a three, 
2 goes in here becomes 4, so I think I did that right. All right, I've got a, a 1 half that inside the square root becomes 1 fourth. No, that's not right. Because I've got a 12 squared. Well, we don't need to work it out. We could punch it out with a calculator and we get that number for that. And so those are my two roots of the characteristic equation or my poles or my eigenvalues. Which means that my homogeneous solution, which this is a homogeneous problem, looks like that. And then the last step is to apply the initial conditions. Which means zero, sorry, one is x at time zero. That was our initial problem because we're saying we're pulling the mass over to one meter and then we're going to let it go. So we take our solution and we plug in zero for t. So e to the zero is one. So that's one equation that we need to solve for C1 and C2. And then we have to differentiate. And at time zero, x dot is going to be zero because we're holding it still. So the derivative is minus 2.683 C1e to the zero, because we're going to plug in zero, minus 9.317 C2e to the zero. And so this is our first equation. This is our second equation. Solve them simultaneously. We can take the second one and solve for C1 and substitute back up here. Yeah, that's what I did. So C1 is minus 3.4726 C2. And we can take that and stick it up here and solve for C2. And then stick that back up here to get C1. And that tells us exactly what our solution looks like for this problem. So that means those numbers go up here and that's our solution. So does this bring back memories of differential equations? Hopefully they're not nightmares. But you remember doing this, right? And it's, it's really, it's a cookbook approach. You just plug in the, the ST, you find the polynomial, you solve it, and then you stick those numbers into the solution where you need them, do the initial conditions, and you're good. So you look at that and you go, what does that look like? We pull the mass over, we let it go, what does it do? 
We've got some exponentials, right? So as t gets larger and larger, looks like these numbers e to the minus, e to the minus, so these negative numbers here, as t gets larger, they're gonna go to zero, right? But we have to add them together to figure out what it looks like. But the nice thing is that that kind of confirms <coughs> our stability, doesn't it? So our dynamics here say that, yeah, it looks like it's going to return back to zero. As time goes to infinity, e to the minus something, we'll just call it a t, goes to zero. So x h of t goes to zero in the limit as time goes to infinity. And so that's the dynamics. It looks like it does return back to equilibrium. How about overshoot? Maybe we ought to plot this to find out. Let's see if I can get this thing to show. I think it'll show well enough if we do that. Let's see if we can do this. So I did an Excel spreadsheet where I'm plotting X and V, so X and X dot as a function of time. So I just used my solution equation for XH and plugged in different values of T and plotted it. And so what does the position do? As time gets large, X started out at the initial condition of, Z of one, which is correct. And then it slowly drops down to zero. And it doesn't look like it overshoots, does it? It doesn't overshoot that zero position. So it just smoothly slides over and stops. Now we'll find out as we change the damping next time that we get a different response. And the velocity makes sense. It starts out at zero velocity, speeds up, and then as the spring becomes less and less stretched, the velocity slows down and it stops at that position. So physically, this makes sense, and the solution, the mass solution, fits what we would think would happen. Okay, so I think that's a good place to stop, and we're out of time anyway. <laughs>